Okay, so welcome back. Uh, this is part eight, I believe, in our series where we show you how to convert your Arduino into an oscilloscope. And you can see here we have no external hardware. We just have our Arduino hooked up via USB to our computer. And in my case, I've got two wires coming in from my function generator. And you can see here the application that we've been developing. And it's got a lot of functionality. We talked in previous videos how to set that up and how to write the C-sharp code. And we also talk about some of the design concepts and build a block diagram. So really, you can implement this application in just about any language. You don't need C sharp. In this video, we're going to focus on the frequency measurement. You can see up here on the left, we've got frequency. So I've got coming in from my frequency generator a 200 hertz sine wave. And you can see the frequency measurement is bouncing around. Uh, but it doesn't say 200 hertz. It says uh, 194, 210, so it's bouncing around. And that will give you an, an indication of some of the challenges we will have in trying to get an accurate frequency measurement from our Arduino. We talked about in previous videos that the Arduino has some capabilities and some limitations. And one of the limitations is that it has a relatively slow scan rate. In other words, how many samples can it do every second uh, on the waveform. You can see here we've got a 40 millisecond scan time and it's refreshing that every about tenth of a second. And that 40 milliseconds represents, you can see over here, 100 samples in each scan. So it's doing 100 samples, then refreshing and doing another 100. And each scan, it's updating its measurement of the frequency. What we're doing here is just one approach, and we'll talk about the other approach. But this approach basically just measures time between zero crossings in one cycle. And once you've got the time for each cycle, you just invert that to get the frequency. And you can see, not really very accurate. The other approach we'll talk about is doing a FFT, a Fast Fourier Transform, which I think most people are going to want to do because um, usually you don't want just the raw zero crossing frequency. You want the frequency components of a waveform. And the FFT will give you all of the frequency components of a specific waveform. So um, we'll start out talking about this simple zero crossing detector to determine the frequency, and then we'll talk about the FFT. So um, with the zero crossing, you can see the accuracy is not going to be all that good. And again, that's due to the sample rate, the limited sample rate of this um, Arduino. And this is even with what we talked about previously, this high speed mode that gives you a very relatively fast analog read for each sample, but still it's nowhere near what you're going to need for some really accurate time readings. So here's a little diagram of how we're going to approach this um, very basic frequency measurement. And you can see I've got a sine wave here. And what we've done is we have first removed the average value. We talked about this in the previous video where we did AC and DC coupling. Uh, we start out with AC coupling where all the DC is removed, so you've got a variation around zero volts. That way you, we, we can measure these zero crossings and use that as a timestamp to determine how much time in one cycle of the waveform. So what we're going to do in this application is we're going to take our array of values, and as we mentioned before, this has got 100 samples per scan in an array. So we're updating that array with 100 new values each scan. So it's going to go through that array of values. It's going to start out and find the first zero crossing in that array of values. And the way it's going to do that is it's going to say, OK, I'm going to look at my value, my voltage value. If it's positive and the previous voltage value of the previous sample is negative, that means we have a zero crossing. So if we have that zero crossing, I'm going to make note of what time this has occurred. And I'm going to then go on and, and keep measuring the samples to see the next time we get a positive where the previous one was negative. So as it goes through, the, these are all positive. There's no negatives. 
here is negative, but the previous was positive, so that doesn't count. So then we're going to keep going and going. And finally, when we start the next waveform, the next cycle, we're going to say, okay, I've got a positive and the previous was negative. Therefore, that ends this cycle. So what I can do is I can take the difference between the time that the end occurs and the time that the start occurs. And the difference gives me how many seconds in one cycle. And of course, the inverse of that is cycles per second or hertz. So this is how we're going to approach the measurement of frequency. And again, because of the challenges with relatively so sample rates, um, these time values aren't going to be real accurate. That's why we're going to have some challenges with frequency measurements. One of the problems could be, you know, maybe my next sample wasn't exactly one cycle away. Maybe it was a little bit different. So the previous one, maybe the next one is like this. So depending on the sample rate, um, we're going to get some inaccuracies in our measurement. So for example, um, with our high speed mode, each sample takes about 20 microseconds, which means that the sample times can be different by 20 microseconds. So how do we figure out what the effect of the sample rates is on frequency accuracy? Well, uh, the best way to find out is to look at the actual numbers. Don't just wave your hands and make believe you understand it. Uh, go through and look at the actual numbers. So what I've done is I put together an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, again, Excel, wonderful tool for engineering. If you want to understand stuff, you want to simulate stuff, it's really wonderful. Uh, poorly implemented, I think, but it's really a wonderful tool. So what we're going to do is we are going to assume that we have a scan of 500 samples per scan. So we have over here 500 samples, and we're going to also assume that we're looking at a 100 millisecond scan time or a burst of 100 milliseconds worth of data. And we're also going to assume we're feeding it a frequency of 100 hertz. So we want to see with that, uh, those samples and that scan time, if I feed it 100 hertz, how much off are we going to be in terms of frequency measurement? Well, the sample time per sample in microseconds is basically I've got 500 samples in 100 milliseconds. That comes out to 200 microseconds or 0.2 milliseconds per sample. The frequency is 100 hertz, which means in one cycle, I have 0.01 seconds per cycle. So if I have a sample time of 200 microseconds and I'm feeding it a waveform that has 0.01 seconds in each cycle, we're talking about 0.01 seconds plus a variation of 0.2 milliseconds or 200 microseconds how does that translate to a frequency variation? Well, if you do the math, if I'm off, if I'm one sample low, I'm going to get 98 instead of 100, or I could get 102 on the high side. So it's plus or minus 2 hertz. So now what if we have, say, 500 samples, and we're looking at 10 millisecond uh, burst or 10 millisecond scan, and we're feeding it a 5,000 hertz or 5 kilohertz frequency. Well, if you do the math, the minimum should be around 4,545, which means it's almost 500 hertz low, and it could be 500 hertz high. So you can see that makes a huge difference, um, the sample rate, and by it being very slow or relatively slow for each sample, you can get into some really wild values of frequency. So, you know, just something to keep in mind that this sample rate really has a big impact on your final frequency measurements. So here's our application and I've got that. I've got 500 samples per scan and I'm looking at 10 milliseconds. And you can see the frequency is bouncing around by um, 4762 up to 5195. So at least a two or 300 hertz um, variation ab above and below what it should be.
So again, very difficult to get a decent um, reading. And in fact, this um, result is after I've done some little fudge factor in our measurements. And really, the long sample times isn't the only factor we have to consider. Keep in mind that if you look at the previous videos when we showed how we generate the time samples for each value, instead of getting the exact accurate microseconds from the Arduino, we generate it ourselves based on the presumed sample rate. But actually, those are off. So that's also going to contribute to the um, frequency variation. So now let's take a look at the C sharp code that we're going to use to calculate the frequency. Now here I am in my main application, my form one, and I showed before we got docs to do initializing form one, which just sets up the UI and the charts. And then we've got these methods and the event handlers. And as we mentioned before, the um, system timer generates an event every time we want to refresh the um, and update the oscilloscope. So we do maybe 500 samples. And then when we're all done with that plotting, we do it again, we refresh it. So that timer is going to call one of these methods to start the update process to read more data, process it, and plot it. And it calls this read Arduino burst method. And you can see it reads the data. And the next thing it does is it, call, it calls this process data burst method that's right below it. So it's read the data. And now it says, OK, process that data. And the process data burst, part of it is it updates the display on the oscilloscope to show the maximum volts, the average volts, and the frequency. And the way it does that is it calls the getFreak method inside our input data processor. So we'll jump over to the input data processor and look at the methods and go down to the getFreak. So basically, all of these things are operating on the very important um, double array called the process double array that has the time comma value of each sample in it. So it's got, you know, if it's like 500 samples, it's an array of 500 time value elements. So here is the get frequency method that's, that's detecting subsequent positive zero crossings in the first wave in the scan. It grabs the first cycle in the array and figures out the frequency. First thing it does, it sets a Boolean uh, to false of whether or not we've detected the first positive going zero crossing. We set that to false. Then we set up a for loop to go through each element of the array. And we're just doing a subset of this array so we're going through, and we're first detecting a positive going zero crossing. And if the value of the process double array previously was less than zero, and process double array, the present value, is greater than zero, that means we've detected a positive going zero crossing. If that's true, and if we haven't yet detected the start the start positive zero crossing, if that's false, then we grab the start time as the time value of that present element, and then we set the start detected equals true. And then we keep going through and going through until we detect the next positive going zero crossing. And if start detected is true, in other words, we've, we've got the first one, now we're waiting for the second one, if that's true, that means we're, we've got the first one. So then we go in and set the end time as the time value for the present element. And we just take the difference between the end time and the start time and divide that into a thousand since we're dealing with milliseconds. And that gives us the frequency. So it's really very simple. You can get fancy on this if you want. But we're just doing one cycle and detecting the frequency. Now, I also mentioned previously that one other factor that affects the accuracy of this frequency measurement is the way that we generated our own time steps for each sample in our burst of data. And let me show you in our uh, read, as we mentioned, read Arduino burst calls this process data burst 
method, which is right below it. And in that process data burst, it's basically got all the data came in from the Arduino and it parses it into integers. And then it determines what the time step is for each sample based on knowing the total duration in milliseconds for the burst of data and dividing that by the number of samples. And that should give us a pretty accurate determination of how many milliseconds per sample, okay? So we, we're going to use that to do the plotting. It's going to give us a uh, time value for each sample so that we don't have to grab it from the Arduino and waste all the memory and so on. However, that, that calculation isn't really exact enough. So what I had to do is I added a little fudge factor, and that's pretty much by trial and error. I had to make this sample interval milliseconds a little bit different so that the frequency reading would be a little bit better. Now, again, it's a science project. If you want to delve into it, it's still it's not going to be very accurate. You saw the results. Even with this, the accuracy can be way off, but uh, if you want to get down into it, you can, you can make a more accurate frequency measurement. Now, another approach I mentioned is that you can do a fast Fourier transform. A while back, I posted uh, at least one or two or three videos talking about fast Fourier transform in C Sharp and how you can generate a fast Fourier transform from an input CSV file. And here's the application we generated. As you recall from this series, um, what I did is I added a single shot feature, which takes a um, snapshot of the waveform on the screen and saves that to CSV. That's really helpful not only for debugging, but it also allows you to do further signal processing on the uh, waveform. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this single and it's going to automatically save as a CSV. So it's just saved it as a CSV and I can read that CSV. And there's the input waveform. You can see it's identical to what we had on the scope. And now I can select the maximum frequency I want on the FFT. And since this is a one kilohertz uh, sine wave, I'll select maybe five kilohertz and then plot the FFT. And you can see it gives us an FFT that is fairly clean around one kilohertz. So um, another way you can do it, I encourage you if you want to implement this in this oscilloscope, Take a look at my previous video. The code is fairly simple um, to do an FFT on this uh, CSV file. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Otherwise, um, I think that's about it for the frequency. Um, if you like any of these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe and hit the bell notifications. And most of all, please let other people know that we're here um, so we get some more viewers. Really appreciate it. Take care and have a really good day. Thanks.